Can you hear me fine or? Yeah. Yep. All right. So today I wanted to talk about um, implementing blind TCP IP hijacking based on a paper from FRAC64. Um, the paper was called Blind TCP IP Hijacking Still Alive. Um, has anyone read this paper? Or Yes, no? OK, a couple of people, not many. All right, I'll go over it. So, um, so yeah, I'm not nearly as badass as the actual paper. Um, however, it's really interesting and seems to have gotten very little attention. Um, I've been trying to implement the paper. However, time constraints and uni has sort of killed all my time. And so I don't actually have a working implementation to release yet. Um, I'll talk about when I hope to a bit later. Um, so I'll just do a run through of the relevant parts of TCP IP for anyone who's a bit rusty. I'll have a run through of the paper, show what kind of issues there are I encounter when actually trying to implement it, um, how these issues were solved and in some cases still not solved. Um, what can we do with this specific attack? How can we stop the attack and where this is gonna go from here? Um, so I'm mostly a web app guy, network, so not really my thing, but I've been able to sort of model my way through writing parts of this attack tool, um, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you guys something interesting about it. Um, so I'm also an associate consultant in Stratsec in more or less my spare time since I'm mostly a uni student. Um, this device on the slide has more or less just taken over my life. So if anyone wants to talk about like building operating systems on top of the OKL4 microkernel for this hardware, I am so your man. But um, that's pretty much everything that's been happening in my life for the past like 10 weeks. Uh, however, so to start with the very, very basics, um, TCP IP is kind of this layered model. Um, we start, we send data encapsulated inside of like TCP uh, packets, which is encapsulated inside of IP packets, which are encapsulated in Ethernet frames or whatever your access medium is. Um, the attacks we're gonna talk about here um, apply specifically to TCP and IP together. So TCP on some other kind of internet protocol, I'm not sure what it'd be, but like X25 or something, um, this wouldn't apply there. This is just TCP on IP based networks. Um, so what IP provides is if you put an IP packet out um, inside like an ethernet frame onto an IP network um, and you send it to some host, the IP layer should provide some kind of packet delivery um, from one host to another. Uh, the packets look sort of like this. The Essentially, three important parts of this packet for this talk is essentially source and destination address, which everyone should be familiar with, um, but also this 16-bit identification field. Um, I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but yeah, essentially in IP routing, we put this packet out into the network. We say it came from a certain address, and we say we want it to go from a certain address. So essentially, we can spoof these packets, and a receiving host has no way to figure out if that if that packet came from the host that it says it came from. Um, again, should be common knowledge, but just want to reiterate. Um, an interesting thing to note is that IP is just best effort um, packet delivery. Um, it provides no concept of connections. It, it might lose packets, it might reorder them, which sort of explains some of the um, design choices that have had to be made in TCP. So this identification packet that I pointed out in the IP header um, is used as far as I can tell to allow for IP fragmentation. Um, if you have uh, different link mediums and, diff uh, and different maximum transmission units, so how much um, data you can put into a single frame on that physical medium. Uh, what's this doing? Sorry. Um, if you have different amounts, uh, oh no. So um, if you have different amounts of data you can put onto different mediums um, and say you're a router, you get an IP packet off one medium which can send really large packets um, and you have to send it out on some medium where you can't, you need some way of being able to split that one packet into uh, multiple packets and then have the host on the other end be able to re reassemble them. Um, so each packet that a host sends out um, is meant to have a unique um, IP ID, um, I, this identification field, so that when a router sort of fragments this into various um, 
IP packets, the host on the other end can see, oh, these, um, these fragments that I got all correspond to one packet and puts them back together. So the, the fact that this, um, that this paper um, exploited was the fact that on some operating systems, in, in particular Windows, um, this field is incremental. Um, so every time Windows sends out a new IP packet, it just increments the um, global IP ID counter. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, so in most cases, since like the maximum transmission on uh, most networks is fairly high for what we're going to do, one IP datagram is pretty much equivalent to one IP packet. Um, it obviously can be different, but largely isn't. Uh, th there are some operating systems where this number isn't simply incremented, but there's some kind of pseudo-random number generator. Um, there has been analysis of these that found that they were weak. However, um, I'm not going to specifically look at this case, but it, it can be worked with um, if you can predict like values a couple of, say, thousand I into the future. Um, so the relevant parts of the TCP packets we need to look at um, are obviously the source and destination port, which specify a connection, and these sequence and acknowledgement numbers. Um, so. When we have some kind of TCP connection, what we really mean is we have like this, uh, we're sending packs from one IP to another, um, from one source port uh, on that on the source IP to the destination port on the destination IP. Um, and this sort of uh, full value tuple specifies the connection. Um, in addition to this, uh, we have these sequence and acknowledgement numbers, um, which are mostly used to, um, just achieve reliable data transmission, but essentially provide the only real security in TCP. Um, the reason for this is when you send a packet to that um, for a value tuple of port IPs and ports, um, when a host gets a packet on what is that connection, um, it validates the sequence and acknowledgement fields um, to see if it's expecting these particular uh, bytes of the stream at this time. Um, so when, when you bootstrap a connection, when you start, when you do like the th TCP three-way handshake, um, you um, essentially transfer a sequence number to the other host and you get one back. Um, and every time you send a byte, it essentially has um, a sequence number attached to that byte. Some flags do as well, but it's largely irrelevant here. Um, we, so we number each of these bytes and when we send a packet, we send the sequence number as the uh, value of the first byte in our packet. Um, the ACK number we send um, is the value of the, like, is meant to be the last packet we got from the other guy. Um, when this is validated on the other end, um, it, it's done in implementation specific ways, but essentially it's meant to say, this is the last packet we got. Um, it, Everything before that, don't worry, we, we have that all. Um, another um, thing from the TCP header that we need to note is the window size. Uh, TCP controls the amount of um, data clients are meant to be able to put onto the wire at any one time without receiving acknowledgement of them. Um, this is obviously variable for different um, hosts and networks and things, but during essentially the sort of startup connection, sorry, startup periods of connections, these windows are kind of negotiated. Um, so that, say, on Windows by default, um, the, it'll accept up to like 64K of data without um, uh, it needing to be sort of acknowledged. So after we sort of say, if we're conducting this kind of attack where we want to inject data into um, some kind of TCP connection, that's the IPs and ports, um, and one of the hosts gets a packet. To check if it's valid, the checks it does um, is, well, first it checks that the packet isn't malformed and similar things, but it checks that the sequence number um, is greater than or equal to the, the next byte we expect and is less than the sequence number plus the window size. So we'll accept any, um, any sort of byte in the stream within that window size. This is necessary because again, IP can drop packets, IP can reorder packets. Um, implementations also sometimes check the ACK value. Um, essentially, the check that should be done here is that, is this something we have sent? Um, and this isn't something that, um, 
that's lower than what they've acknowledged. Uh, it should really just be, is this something we have sent?